So uh, our co-organizer, Raju Bapi, will be joining us to deliver the summary and future trends. Can, can you hear me? It's okay to ask. <laughs> Though we only have 15 more minutes. <laughs> so am I audible? Yes, we can hear you. Right, right. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Maria. I uh, will now uh, take the last part, start uh, summarizing quickly and then we will look at uh, the crystal ball to see what kind of future trends we can uh, expect or propose from our perspective. Uh, the, what we have seen, one of the things that I want to point out uh, to the larger community, cognitive science and cognitive modeling community is that uh, we are, I mean, these are exciting times in terms of uh, the access to you know, public neuroimaging data, data sets of uh, various tasks that are starting to be available now. Uh, so, and uh, it turns out there are opportunities that uh, these availability of these data sets uh, afford us. Uh, one major aspect that I would like to sort of point out is uh, uh, in this domain, data is ahead of theory. That is, there is a lot of data available, uh, however, uh, waiting to be methodologically uh, processed with innovative methods, as well as proposal for theories of how brain, uh, you know, uh, how information is organized in the brain. At use uh, deep learning tools as ways of uncovering patterns from these brain responses. Uh, I think it's a powerful uh, opportunity. Uh, of course, we there are challenges associated with this uh, uh, excitement that uh, most of these data sets right now, for example, the ones that we talked about Manish presented in the beginning. For example, there are listening data sets. Uh, of course, uh, the data set collection has moved to more uh, uh, naturalistic stimuli. However, uh, these are quite uh, uh, open data sets. Uh, it also might help to have more hypothesis driven data collection apart from these, uh, uh, you know, the uh, uh, open kind of uh, listening data sets or viewing data sets, passive uh, data sets are a task that is given, but that's uh, quite uh, just to make sure they are engaged with the stimuli. You know, the, typically, a one back task is uh, used, but uh, it mostly it is uh, uh, looking at the shapes and making sure if the shape repeats, you press a button. This is, ensures that the experimenter is uh, sure you are paying attention to the stimulus more than uh, asking you to process the stimuli. Right? So uh, the other uh, challenge uh, typically is uh, individual variability in some sense is the norm in uh, neuroimaging data. As you can expect, uh, uh, the response evoked to a stimulus uh, can be quite uh, varied and rich, depending you know, on the, the memory network uh, from which a response is evoked, the experience uh, an individual might have gone through, the emotional states that are attached to the stimulus, all these could have individual variation, and all of them are reflected in the evoked response. And when you are now trying to use these uh, uh, either for encoding models or decoding models, you face challenges. 
And typically, in the, uh, many of these results that you have seen, for example, for the Pereira data set, you are building models for individual uh, subjects, right? And this uh, is uh, quite typical. And uh, of course, you would like to know what is invariant across uh, all these uh, representations that stands for a particular concept, right? So we are still away from that, but this is uh, uh, also because of the kind of variability that you see in the data collected. And the uh, last uh, uh, part uh, is that the data that is uh, uh, collected is complex uh, in ways that I've just described in terms of uh, what it stands for with respect to the stimulus could be a complex relationship. And also uh, this can be quite noisy. Uh, uh, typical functional MRI, you are working with a very low signal to noise ratio. Uh, so, uh, so this uh, uh, this is an, uh, poses another challenge, especially for people uh, like us who are interested in applying deep learning models for modeling uh, neuroimaging data. Deep learning models are trained uh, by uh, data sets which are uh, clean in some sense. You know, take uh, ImageNet data set, uh, any of these classical data sets that are used for training deep learning. Uh, models. Uh, in fact, actually, as a, you inject noise to make sure the models are robust, uh, whereas in neuroimaging data, noise comes for free, uh, of course, and uh, which also means that it poses challenges for uh, computational model building. Uh, so what we have seen in this tutorial, just as a quick summary, that we looked at uh, stimulus representations uh, in different uh, domains, vision, language, uh, and I'm not listing all of them, but emphasizing that uh, we uh, these uh, stimulus representations uh, uh, extracted from deep learning models such as transformers for language, CNN uh, for vision, and we looked at uh, currently available data sets and. Uh, the form that uh, you would have filled to download this one patient, uh, one subject data right, uh, from Neuromod uh, is uh, another rich data set, uh, uh, unique in some sense, uh, quite multimodal. Uh, and there are other data sets that uh, we listed. Manish had uh, gone through comprehensively the reading, listening, viewing tasks in different modalities, MEG, FMRI, more EEG has not been emphasized in this tutorial, but there are also data sets available for. And we looked at uh, both linear and nonlinear encoding and decoding models, uh, and also the uh, some of the advanced methods that Maria just talked about uh, in the previous uh, section. Uh, covering variety of uh, approaches, you know, emphasizing how DL models could be tuned using brain recordings, right? I mean, here you are using information from uh, fMRI actually to tune your DL model, right? Then the task-based models and, and different, uh, and this is a frontier disentangling uh, contributions from different information sources that uh, uh, actually uh, participate in evoking brain response. And it's an interesting uh, frontier area that she gave a glimpse of recent work in that. Uh, I, one thing I wanted to emphasize just uh, so it is, uh, so this uh, proposal by Krieger's court in 2008 of a representational similarity analysis uh, Kind of a powerful idea in some sense, uh, I'll go to the visual. Uh, on the left, what you see is uh, the three different branches that systems neuroscience is uh, grappling with. There are computational models of different kinds, built symbolic connectionists, uh, biologically realistic uh, neural network models and so on. On the one side, um, and on the other side you have 
the brain activity data that's collected uh, through different modalities, all the way from uh, single cell recordings to whole brain recordings of MEG, fMRI. And you also have uh, behavioral data that we actually acquire, uh, which has different measures. Now there are relations captured in each of these, right? You have a computational model that is trying to uh, uh, generate responses based on its internal model. And how are, uh, how is uh, computational models respond for a pair of stimuli? And how does this differ when you are recording a brain activity? And how is that manifested when you look at the behavioral data measurements for the two responses? And, and these uh, lie in different domains. One is in computational, empirical, uh, either brain imaging data or behavioral data. Is there a way we can compare these? The traditional systems neuroscience uses, uh, for example, neurometric functions, psychometric functions as a, a ways of uh, relating uh, one more to the other psychometric uh, data that response profiles uh, with respect to resolution of stimuli, right? So it uh, uh, tries to model these, but uh, based on sparse uh, data, uh, you know, data points that you use to fit a psychometric model or a neurometric function, they're quite sparse. So uh, uh, is there a general way to relate uh, uh, these and representational similarity uh, analysis that uses the similarity matrices uh, offers a pos uh, powerful way of, uh, 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 of cross comparing, right? They use uh, these kind of, uh, kind of multivariate methods that use uh, second order isomorphisms. In the, so, so similarity of responses that are in behavioral data, uh, what do you see in the computational model? What is the correlation, right? Now it opens up a uh, 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 range of possibilities of relating uh, responses from different kinds of uh, uh, efforts, uh, whether single cell recordings, computational model, human fMRI, sing single cell recordings, by their very nature, uh, can only be done in uh, 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 currently in you know in uh, uh, monkeys and so on and in very limited cases in patients, you get uh, a surface uh, recordings from electrocorticograms, right? So how do we relate these? And RSA uh, offers a, a powerful way to do that. I wanted to emphasize that. And uh, looking at future trends, uh, hierarchical organization seems to be an organizing principle, whether it is in the model or in the in the brain, early visual areas to late visual areas, uh, there seems to be uh, empirical evidence that there are simple to complex uh, 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 um, information that is encoded. And so uh, there is recent work uh, from uh, Kamitani's group in, uh, which tries to uh, operationalize this into a hierarchy score. Uh, in this, what they try to do is uh, take an fMRI voxel activation, try to predict uh, 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 activity of a deep neural network uh, uh, unit in a DNN. And similarly, take activity from DNN and try to predict uh, voxel, fMRI voxel, right? So these encoding and decoding analysis, uh, they uh, define what is called a brain hierarchy score and uh, they aggregate the uh, hierarchy score computed uh, both in the decoding uh, aspect where you are trying to predict DNN activation from uh, fMRI and also in the encoding where you are predicting fMRI from DNN. And the aggregate score is a, a called a, a brain hierarchy score. Here, for example, the, uh, this unit in the second layer of uh, DNN 
and which of the ROIs is the early visual, late visual, which of them gives the highest correlation, right? So in this case, for example, this unit uh, is better predict, uh, it's uh, uh, the uh, region that uh, top ROI is uh, B2, visual area two, right? Like that, you do that for all the uh, visual hierarchy, for all the layers, and you get uh, some sort of uh, distribution of these correlation scores or hierarchy scores. And you also get a similar thing in the uh, effort where you use uh, voxel information to predict uh, 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 these uh, predict voxel activations, uh, right, using uh, um, the layers of, uh, you are predicting uh, layer activations using these uh, ROI. Uh, responses and you get a, a distribution of these rank uh, uh, correlations uh, which correspond to the BH score. And what is interesting in this is that uh, on the uh, horizontal axis, you have image recognition accuracy of uh, some of the uh, earlier, you know, classic networks like Alex AlexNet and the later developments, ResNet inception. Uh, they have been optimized for uh, image recognition accuracy on a standard benchmark like ImageNet, right? And this, uh, uh, it, uh, surprisingly, the ones that have been optimized for image recognition accuracy have, have a poor uh, brain hierarchy score for this encoding decoding hierarchy compared to AlexNet. So one of the questions that uh, comes up is what is the gap between this high performing deep neural networks and uh, the relationship to the you know brain like hierarchy if uh, hierarchical organization is uh, an organizing principle so what uh, these uh, uh, these differences mean is uh, something that needs to be looked at in the future and the uh, other uh, aspect that i wanted to point out here is uh, the idea of uh, multimodal, multitask uh, uh, learning uh, brain responses to a stimulus uh, is multimodal and multitask oriented. And this work and uh, Subha presented something about our work on cross view, multi view decoding, where our hypothesis is that the brain response is rich and that uh, 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 viewing data, picture viewing data response, brain response associated with this could in principle be used for uh, other tasks such as question answering, caption, image captioning and so on. So this is a recent work uh, uh, from Fay et al, which shows that uh, what they have shown is that the traditional models use uh, strong semantically correlated data where you have an image that is uh, annotated painstakingly of all the constituents of this image. These are the fruits, this is a candle, this is a cake, and so on. And so this is uh, modeling by image to text translation approach. In contrast, what they have done is uh, crawl the web and uh, come up with image text space that, are, that do not have the same strong semantic correlation. When they use this kind of data in an unsupervised way, the representations that are developed have shown very high accuracy in downstream tasks like uh, text retrieval, image to text retrieval, or captioning, visual uh, question answering, and so on. And although this does not have any fMRI data, and this perhaps points to what uh, one could do, such rich representations that are uh, based on uh, uh, weakly semant weak semantically correlated data. And the representations are much more general and these might be more uh, useful for modeling brain responses, right? Uh, and some of the results from their paper, which uh, this is with the classical uh, uh, generative adversarial network-based image generation is a cartoonish uh, sort of, uh, 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 image generation compared to more naturalistic, more realistic uh, 
images that can be uh, uh, reconstructed. Not only that, that these kind of weak correlated, uh, semantically correlated uh, data uh, uh, and the representations that are learned using this can also give rise to uh, these kind of uh, images castle in the clouds, right? Uh, this is, uh, it doesn't really exist in the real world, but uh, it is possible to generate uh, images corresponding to this uh, thought. As this is, uh, I thought this is quite exciting. Maybe these representations are much more rich and useful for understanding brain uh, information organization future. So, and uh, 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 one other quick point I want to make, uh, I'm also running out of time, is uh, this is uh, a very interesting paper from Yuri Hassan's group at Princeton, uh, talking about how the recent uh, uh, deep networks with their, their training trained on big data as opposed to sparse data in the older uh, regime, with the, which they call it ideal fit models with impoverished data are trying to generalize to a bigger uh, generalization space compared to these uh, uh, over parameterized uh, sort of uh, models that are trained on uh, a dense sampling of the of this uh, sampling space that are able to generate uh, better uh, interpolation accuracies but they are still falling short of uh, generalization beyond uh, this uh, interpolation zone, right? And most of the higher order cognition lies in the ability to see beyond the examples, right? And uh, the ability to extrapolate to qualitatively novel situations that go beyond the training data. And this is where I think uh, our DM uh, uh, need to focus and also, uh, you know, they would be quite useful for modeling brain responses. And uh, the last point I want to make is, uh, this is, uh, uh, <clears throat> uh, this is experimental result from a semantic dementia patient with the right anterior lobe damage. This uh, patient is from Snowden's group. Julie Snowden's group, uh, uh, who reported uh, on this task called animal habitat task. The patient was asked the question, where would you find this? And they are given these stimuli, these 3D images or toys, a frog, for example, a cow, uh, 3D caricature or I mean image of a, or a model of a cow, a duck and so on. And the responses, uh, the patients gave, uh, do not give any idea. They understand what the stimulus is, right? I don't know this, uh, uh, usually found in a house, it looks like a dog, things like that, right? Whereas when you give the lexical item that corresponds to this, like the word frog, and they were asked the same question, where would you find this? And they are able to retrieve more accurately for all these stimuli. Right, cow, uh, it's found on a farm, right? So this is a damage, uh, and these are it's one patient, but the similar qualitatively similar results. So what does anterior temporal lobe damage uh, uh, render to the conceptual network of the patient and the degradation that you see? Now, do your DL models exhibit such damage uh, due to degradation, degradation in units that are apparently uh, modeling have a high response score for anterior temporal lobe, for example. If I damage, do I see this kind of patterns of degradation, right? I mean, this could be a brain damage test that uh, one could use to uh, look at, you know, how we can move the DNNs more toward how brain organizes information and also how brain uh, uh, damage causes uh, disruption in the information organization in the brain. So with that, I hand over to Maria to talk about uh, DNNs as model organisms and uh, 
then we can actually come to questions at the end. forward one more slide awesome thanks thank you just a second great um yeah so I, I just wanted to mention one more thing uh because this is uh, again very uh near to my heart uh which is to look at deep neural networks as a model organism for different cognitive functions and the reason why i say model organism and not just a computational model is because these deep neural networks were not uh, created to model the brain, right? They are created to do some kind of other task. Uh, and so uh, I, don't, I don't quite uh, think of them as computational models of specific cognitive functions. I think of them as separate entities that we can use to investigate some necessary or sufficient uh, information for performing specific tasks. Uh, and so these model organisms uh, are interesting because they allow us to do direct interventions, which are not necessarily easy to do in humans uh, because of ethical or practical uh, constraints. Uh, and so, yeah, I think this is a very exciting area. And uh, I showed a few uh, works that are in this area. For example, the super word meaning work where we made an intervention to remove uh, individual word meaning and were able to make some inferences about fMRI and image recordings. Uh, but yeah, I think there's a lot more work uh, in this area to do. Great. And then just the last slide, um, if you can advance. Thank you. <laughs> Uh, yeah. So, uh, yeah, we wanted to thank you so much for attending. Uh, this has been really a pleasure to get a chance to share our perspective and hear your questions, and we'd love to chat more uh, offline after this. Uh, we just wanted to point uh, you again to our repo. We'll continue to update it in the next few days. Uh, and again, we wanted to thank the Courtois Neuromod group. Uh, they uh, are, are an amazing group. They have over 100 hours of fMRI recordings of people processing different stimuli, very rich naturalistic stimuli, uh, also playing games in an fMRI uh, scanner. So they have a, a lot of rich fMRI recordings. Uh, so I wanted to thank them again for allowing us to use their data. So thank you.